like to thank the organizer for uh, asking me to uh, give a, a course uh, in uh, topo theory. Um, that uh, course that I share with uh, Olivia. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, we 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 have some discuss we had some discussions uh, Olivia and me on uh, uh, what to do. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, sort of insisted to try to give the big picture of uh, topos theory because I think uh, uh, topos theory has uh, evolved quite uh, a bit since uh, its creation by uh, Grothendieck and his uh, students. Uh, and maybe it's time to understand what's, what's going on. Uh, I will be um, uh, separating my course in three parts. There are four hours. So it's a bit of a problem because it's difficult to divide four by three. And, uh, but I will do my best. Uh, this, I will start with the theory of locales. Um, so I will spend uh, this uh, first uh, hour and a, half and a fourth uh, with uh, the theory of locales, and then I will begin with topos theory for the uh, second uh, hour, second part. I will do again uh, uh, some topos theory uh, tomorrow, and I will finish with higher topos theory. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a bit presumptuous of me to... Uh, believe that I can actually describe uh, this, uh, these three theories uh, in uh, four hours. Uh, so I will just make some kind of sketch and some, sometime I will give proof when the proof is really easy. <laughs> if the proof is a bit difficult, I will just uh, maybe uh, discuss the idea of the, uh, of the proof. Um, the theory of locales uh, was invented uh, in the 50, actually, uh, Shao Eresman introduced the notions of locales. And um, many of the things that happen in topos theory can be actually already seen in the theory of locales. So the theory of locales is a good start for topos theory because it's very elementary, it's quite elementary, it's much uh, simpler than topos theory. Uh, and many of the, of the phenomena that uh, happens in topos theory can be seen there. And if you know the theory of locale sometime and you learn topos theory, you say, aha, that's something I know with the theory of locale and it's just the same thing. And so I'm very much, uh, when learning a subject, very much on the idea that you, the, the bottom up approach, not the top down. So um, unfortunately, uh, books in topos theory now they start straight with the topos theory and they give a chapter, maybe uh, uh, chapter nine, chapter 10, the theory of locales, okay? So uh, I very much recommend if you read these books to go straight to the theory of locales, maybe chapter 10 or chapter nine, and then uh, start uh, to read uh, uh, the beginning. Um, maybe a little bit of philosophy to start. Uh, to begin, <coughs> about uh, geometry and algebra. Um, <coughs> we, um, well, algebraic geometry is precisely the subject uh, about the interactions between the interaction between uh, geometry and algebra, and uh, we know that. Uh, Somehow, uh, a lot uh, of uh, what we call geometry, at least uh, so-called commutative geometry as opposed to non-commutative geometry, is about uh, studying rings, commutative rings. And uh, let me just look at this a little bit to start. Um, so suppose that X is a space. And it's, uh, we, we often uh, sort of understand or study the space by looking at maps from X to some ring R. Uh, R itself uh, is, a, is a ring object. It's a, a ring space, if you like. It's a ring object in the category of spaces. whatever category of space you, you have. Uh, 
And um, where do we study uh, maps from X to R? Well, that's uh, historically, this is uh, how things happen. You want, for example, to describe subspaces of, uh, of, uh, of X by uh, uh, using equations. So you take, a, so this is a map F, so you take uh, many of them, F1 to Fn, and uh, you, you describe the equation so you, you look at zero, the intuitions, and you, you pull back and you get the sub, sub object or a sub manifold or sub algebraic variety by uh, describing uh, sub object by equations. Uh, so this is a big discovery. I guess this is due to Descartes that uh, somehow a lot of what we think of of the geometry is completely uh, understood by, uh, or maybe described by the algebra of functions or something like that. Um, <clears throat> now, um, uh, so if you have a space, you look at the, the maps from X to the ring, and this itself is a ring. So this this gives you a functor from let's say uh, uh, map uh, x uh, r from spaces to the category of rings, and very often, very often you uh, can uh, describe. Uh, some kind of adjoint, which uh, maybe you could call this, uh, the spectrum. So that you will have then a, a, a bijection between, um, let's say, um, if you have a ring A, then you have the spec of A. And uh, there is a bijection between the math from X to the spec of A and, and the ring maps from X into map XR. I hope I'm getting it right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, this uh, duality between the rings and, and space does not uh, work perfectly in the sense that very often it's not an equivalence so uh, when it is not an equivalence, you try to improve it uh, either by extending the class of rings you consider or by extending the class of spaces, trying to adjust the two sides. So there is a kind of dialectic. Uh, you have a, a notion of space, a notion zero of spaces, and a notion uh, <coughs> zero of rings and you have a functor, maybe some kind of adjunction between the two and uh, you want to transform it into an equivalence and maybe you extend the notions of rings for that. So you have a notion one and this leads to uh, a notion of space which is a bit more general, space one. And again, this, these things do not fit completely, so you extend one of the two sides to make it, uh, and it keeps on like this. And uh, I don't know what is the uh, end uh, result. I mean, it seems that uh, uh, in mathematics we have been doing that uh, six or seven times, and it keeps on. <clears throat> so... Uh, Maybe I will first with the, uh, cons cons start with the examples of uh, locales. In the case of locale, the spaces are just the topological spaces. So I will write this top for the category of topological spaces. Topological. And, and the ring, in this case, uh, could be taken, of course, the complex to be taken to be the uh, complex numbers, the real numbers, 
but uh, <clears throat> one also uh, has the choice of taking the Sierpinski space. So the Sierpinski space has uh, uh, two points, let's say 0 and 1, uh, and the open uh, of S is uh, um, you have the empty, you have, uh, let's say, 1 is open, and uh, 0, 1. And the, the nice things about the Sierpinski space is that uh, if u is an open subset of, uh, of a space x, maybe I should write it uh, a bit like this, u an open subset, uh, then uh, there is a unique map, a uh, continuous map from x to the Sierpinski space, such that the uh, following square is a pullback. I take one here. So uh, this map here is called the characteristic map of, of the open set. If x is in u, zero, otherwise. And so there is a bijection between a uh, map of uh, x into the Sierpinski space uh, and the open set of x. And <clears throat> so mapping a topological space into the Sierpinski space gives you all the informations about the open subset of, of, of x. So the idea of the theory of locale is to concentrate on the sort of ring that the uh, open set uh, of x is constitute. So, um, so what are the operations on the Sierpinski space? If you, for a general ring, I mean, we are interested uh, in operations the basic operations for a general ring are uh, addition and, and product and multiplication. So what are the operations that exist on the Sierpinski space? Well, uh, general operations, well, I can give you a, a couple of them. Uh, maybe I should write just S. Uh, <coughs> zero, one is a post set. So uh, you can look at uh, uh, suprema and infima on this post set. So that gives you, for example, the suprema, uh, supremum um, of two things will give you an operations, and uh, the infimum will give you another one. And uh, these two operations they, they behave very much like uh, sums and uh, times. Uh, uh, you have, for example, the distributivity law. Uh, of course, you have uh, much more uh, Relations, ma many more a relation than just distributivity law, uh, but uh, also you can uh, consider infinite operations because uh, you can take uh, infinite powers of the Sierpinski space. It's, uh, it's also a topological space, just uh, the product topology, and you can consider continuous maps from uh, S to the I to S as basic operations on open sets. And uh, one of them uh, is just uh, suprema over i. The suprema over i of a family xi 
is just what it is. It's the supremum of the xi. So the supremum over i uh, actually always uh, produce one unless uh, the sequence uh, that you have here is completely zero. And uh, this uh, operation is actually continuous. And this is the basis of the theory of locale. So a locale can be defined to be um, to be uh, actually it's called a frame because uh, uh, we are, when we talk about uh, locales we are really talk, talking about a ring so actually let me draw the, the picture you have rings um, uh, schemes so we know that there is a kind of duality between rings and scheme. And uh, here I'm going to put frames. This is a kind of ring-like objects. And here uh, to put locales, which is just like the opposite category. The category of locales will be the opposite category. So what is uh, a frame? So the definition is that... Uh, 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 a frame is a complete lattice. Maybe I, I will des describe what is a lattice in a moment, uh, which is such that uh, the distributivity law Distributivity law uh, holds. Um, uh, in this uh, uh, equation, it's important to observe that the uh, the enfimum, which is uh, called the meat, uh, this is the operation here is called meat of x and y, uh, is distributive over uh, arbitrary suprema. Uh, and this is very important uh, for the notions of a frame, and this notion was introduced by uh, Eresman, I think. Uh, R S S. Ah, oui, pardon. Excusez-moi. Well, thanks. Um, uh, so the first example of uh, of a frame is, of course, the lattice of uh, uh, open subset of uh, of a topological space. And uh, maybe I should say what a lattice is: uh, a poset P, maybe L, is a lattice if uh, it is a complete lattice if it admits a suprema uh, com arbitrary suprema and infima. Uh, so that's the notions of a lattice. And it's, it's important to observe that uh, um, uh, it's enough to have suprema or, or enfima. Because 
the enfimum, the enfimum of, uh, of, a, of a subset, so uh, if you have a, a subset S of, of, the, of, the, of the lattice L, uh, you can express the enfimum as the supremum of the set of lower bounds. Of S, so um, that's an important observation, which is of course well known. Uh, so, for example, the lattice of uh, open subset of uh, of uh, topological space is closed under uh, suprema because the suprema is the union, the supremum of a family of open set. So OX is a frame. Uh, the supremum of a family of open set, of course, is uh, the union. But uh, this uh, lattice is also uh, complete. I mean, it has an infimum too, and the infimum uh, of a family the infimum of a family of open set is just the intersection. And then you take the interior of the intersection. Okay. So uh, we see here that the infimum has a kind of uh, weird, uh, apparently weird uh, description because you need to take the interior. And uh, this is why uh, the opposite OX up is not a frame in general. That is, the distributivity of uh, uh, union over intersection, which exists in the power set, I mean, there is a distributivity also because of, of the Morgan law, uh, does not uh, survive when you uh, look at open set. So the opposite of a frame is not a frame. And <clears throat> a map of topological space gives you uh, a map in the other direction. which we could call f upper star, uh, just the inverse image map. And if you look at uh, the properties of uh, this map, is that uh, it is a morphisms of frame. Now, by a morphisms of frame, uh, is, I mean a map, so you have two frames, A and B, so C and A and B. It is a map which uh, preserves the operations arbitrary suprema and a finite uh, enfima or meet. And um, we should not forget that uh, 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 there is a unit element for the meat, which is uh, which I will write one, which is the top element. So uh, one in the case of a frame is x itself, is the unit, is the unit element for the intersection. So uh, this is how the notions of morphisms of a frame, morphism, is defined. And uh, uh, <coughs> it's uh, straightforward to check that uh, the inverse image map uh, is uh, uh, a morphisms of frame. So.
So you get a functor from the category of frames. I, I will write FRM for the category of frames in morphism. And you get a functor uh, that uh, goes in this direction, maybe from top. And uh, let's call it O. Uh, it's a con contravariant functor. Uh, maybe a word about uh, the terminology <laughs> here, because uh, some people say that a contravariant functor they say that this is a contravariant functor, right? Uh, I'm sorry, this is a covariant functor, <laughs> because it's Okay, so uh, <laughs> covariant functor from the covariant, covariant functor is the same as a contravariant functor from C to D. Contravariant. So when you say that a functor is contravariant, you don't need to write up, okay? So because uh, I prefer to do things like that. Uh, and also uh, for posets. I mean, if you have a map of posets, and I will use that, F, map of posets, I mean, it's called preserving the partial order. Uh, you, you have two versions, a contravariant and a covariant one. And so if I want to say that a, a map between two poset is a map of poset. I would say it's a covariant map or a contravariant map. There are two possibilities. Okay, so here you have a contravariant functor. Uh, it turns out that this uh, functor has, a, has, this contravariant functor has an, has an adjoint, uh, which associates to a frame a topological space. Uh, uh, the topological space of its point. So uh, essentially, uh, the points of a frame uh, topologize uh, its uh, harm in the category of frames of A into the, I the uh, initial frame. So uh, by bracket one, I mean, uh, I mean this frame with two elements, zero, this is a frame. This is uh, bracket one is actually uh, O of the, of the of a point. And uh, you define the notions of a point of a frame by looking at uh, morphism from, uh, uh, from the frame to one. And you get an adjunction between, between two contravariant functor um, Maybe I should write explicitly the the form of the bijection. So um, um, so if you have x a topological space and a a frame, uh, then you can look at arm of uh, of uh, A into OX. So this is in the category of uh, frames. And uh, this will be uh, in bijection with the continuous map from the, uh, from X to the space of points of A. To apologize. So there is an adjunction between uh, these two categories, but uh, the adjunction is not an equivalence. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, there, is, uh, there are more uh, objects here uh, than there are topological spaces. 
actually there are frames that, that don't have any point. Uh, so this is why uh, the theory of locales has been uh, called sometimes pointless topology because uh, the points in a locale are not that important in the theory of locales. They are important, but uh, some locales don't have points and they are important uh, for in the theory. So um, <clears throat> I will, maybe I don't have really time to give, to discuss examples, but I just tell you that some locales don't have points. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so what is, how, how does it work, the theory of locales? Well, a, lo a frame, oh, I forgot to tell you what a locale is in this picture. The a locale is just the, an object in the opposite category of the category of frames. So, Uh, locales don't have existence uh, except by being a frame somewhere. So this is kind of, of a fiction. The, uh, the notions of locale is a fiction. The reality is that you, what you have is a frame. But this fiction is very important when you think about the theory. You want to have intuitions about the, the space that you're looking at and so we often look into the opposite of the category of frame. It's a little bit like in algebraic geometry. Sometime in the theory of rings, it's very good to think of a ring as, as an affine scheme. And uh, so we, uh, but in this case, there is an actual notions of a general notions of a scheme, which is uh, uh, partly independent from, well, not exactly from the theory of commutative ring. So, um, so this functor here, which was uh, contravariant, uh, once you use this duality, you get actually a pair of covariant functor. If you change the covariance, if you replace frame by locale, what you get here is a two covariant functor. Yes. Uh, well, uh, in principle, they are defined here. Uh, we could call that a character, you see, uh, of, the, of the locale. The locale is like a ring, and this is like the base ring. And you look, you look at uh, homomorphism from A into the base ring, and in uh, representation theory, this is called a character. So a point of locale is a character. Uh, maybe I could say a little bit about it. Because, <coughs> yes, right. But uh, maybe I, I can say uh, I can say a little bit about the notions of a point uh, for lo of a locale by looking at uh, uh, the homomorphism, a character of a frame. So, <coughs> uh, a character needs to send the element one. You see, it, it must be the characteristic functions of something. Here, there are only two values possible, okay? So it must be the characteristic functions of something. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it sends the, the elements one, the top element here, to one by notions of a morphism. A morphism uh, frame sends the units to the unit. So the only thing which is interesting in the morphism is, is the kernel, kernel of phi. Now, <coughs> this kernel um, <coughs> is closed under suprema because if you, uh, phi is closed under, I mean, respect supre suprema, so uh, the kernel of phi is closed under suprema, so you can take the union of everything that is in the kernel. So let's call that uh, K of phi, the supremum, of, uh, of all x in the kernel of phi and x. So this is the maximum element in the kernel. And if you know this maximum element, you know everything about the character. 
And um, uh, so you may think of this as an open subset of, of the space. So this is open. It's open in the sense that uh, in the locale, it's, it's an open thing, okay? So what, what is so special about these open sets is that uh, they are meet irreducible. So, so uh, if I call u the k of phi, the maximum element in the kernel, u is meet irreducible. Uh, and this means what? This means that if you have, if you express u as the union of two other elements of the uh, of the frame, uh, then it must be that u equal to u1 or u equal u2. Uh, so that's. I'm sorry. Meet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and two, uh, you need that u is different from one, okay? This is called a meet irreducible open set. Uh, why, where, where does this property come from? It comes from the fact that this uh, uh, morphisms of locale respect uh, intersection. If you just play with the axioms, you discover that uh, the, the element u here is meet irreducible. Uh, so the complement of u which normally sh should exist is a closed sublocale. Sub I said nothing about closed sublocale. The complement of U, which is uh, uh, the closed part of A, uh, this is just the A up, actually. There's a lattice of closed subobjects in the locale. This is just the opposite lattice, okay? Uh, is join irreducible. So it's a, it's a join irreducible. So join irreducible means that if F is F1 union F2, then F equal or F equal F2. Uh, so there are two conditions, and the other is that F is not empty. So uh, there is a bijection, if you like, between the points of a locale and the uh, uh, the irreducible uh, close uh, subobject of the locale, so that's one way to understand what what is a point. And in a topological space, uh, if X is a topological space, uh, then if you take an element X of the topological space and then the closure of the singleton. Is is uh, is irreducible, is a closed irreducible. So that's the connection between the classical notions of point of topological space. Is that the morphisms of locale they produce uh, uh, closed uh, subobjects that are uh, irreducible, and uh, um, I don't know if this answers the question. Okay. Uh, in, a, in a topological space, right, this is true, yeah, 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 that's an example of, uh, uh, of closely reducible, but there are, in a topological space, sometimes, closely reducible that don't, have, that don't have a generic point, this is called, a, or a generator, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, okay, now, Okay, so what I want to uh, develop here uh, is uh, the fact that uh, uh, frames are rings, and uh, really, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, frames are rings, <laughs> in a sense that the theory of frames is very much like the theory of commutative rings. So, but it's somehow it is simpler. It is simpler. It's a kind of uh, simple versions of the theory of commutative rings. Uh, so, um, the, 
the category of frames is an algebraic category. In a sense, it is, it's like the category of groups or the category of uh, rings or the category of abelian groups, the category of Lie algebra. Universal algebra applies. So, wh what does it mean? I mean, for example, if you have a morphisms of frame, uh, you can uh, decompose it into three morphisms. Um, should write five there. Uh, like in the theory of rings or whatever, okay? Uh, first, you take the image of the morphism, you get here a subframe. That's the notion of subframe. There's an equivalence relation on A defined, like the usual, a congruence. There is a notion of congruence in the theory of frames. Okay, what, what is the congruence in the theory of frame? Uh, it's an equivalence relation. It's an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is always a sub uh, a subobject of the product, but it should be a subframe of the product. That's all. Okay. An equivalence relation is a congruence if it is a subframe of the product. So it tells you everything about the congruence. So, given the morphisms of frame, there is a congruence. Uh, which I write here uh, as an equivalence. So you can take a quotient to get a frame, and here, and then here you have this as a morphism. So, in other words, there is a notion of surjection in the frame, and uh, the compositions of every map as a surjection followed by an injection, injective morphism, okay? Well, for the theory of locales, it means something. In the theory of locales, you reverse everything, so you have a continuous map, f from x to y, and um, the injection here becomes a quotient locale, okay, let's call it z, a quotient. So, what is the notion of quotient locale? The notion of co quotient locale comes from the notions of subframe. That's just straightforward reversing. And um, the uh, quotient frame leads to an embedding, uh, let's say here, this is embedding of locales. So every uh, morphisms of frames has a decomposition uh, as a quotient followed by an embedding. Uh, except that in the theory of locales, something simpler is happening because uh, a map of locales, a morphisms of locales, let's say five from A to B, has a, has a right adjoint. In in the category of poset, the, the right adjoint is not in the category of locale. The right adjoint is not a morphisms of locale. It's just uh, an order preserving map or a, a covariant map of, between two poset in the category of poset. And this, uh, this is just, this, this follows from the fact that phi preserves suprema. Any map preserving suprema between two complete lattices has a right adjoint. It's a, uh, I'm sorry? Which I will write phi lower star from B to A. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I confused myself. Of frames. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
And the existence of this right adjoint makes things uh, uh, simple uh, about the uh, decomposition because it's a general theorem of, uh, of category theory that if you have two poset, P and Q, and let's say a, a map this way, let's say F, and another map the other way, let's call it G, okay? And, and I'm supposed that F is left adjoint to G. That means that uh, F of X that we have this equivalence. Then, uh, this is well known, uh, you can uh, compose F with G, uh, so you have composed with G and call it sigma. Uh, this is a map from uh, sigma. This is a map from P to P. Uh, this is a closer operator. Uh, on, uh, on on P. So closer operator means that uh, uh, it is uh, of course equivariant, yeah? order preserving. So you have and that and and that you have sigma square of x equals sigma x. And um, uh, the composite the other way, F G. Uh, let's call it a row which is just from Q to Q, is, uh, I, I call that uh, a cumonadic operator. It's the dual of being a closer because a closer operator uh, can be called also uh, a monadic operator. So uh, a cumonadic operator is just a dual. It's an order-preserving operator that uh, satisfy and um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and you have the compositions. If I if I look at the set of uh, sigma closed things in P. And uh, Q row as the row open elements, if you like, or that's the fixed point of row. Then uh, you have the composition of, uh, of F uh, has a, a map first to P sigma, another to Q rho, an inclusion here, and here an isomorphism. That's, uh, you have the compositions like this, and there is a similar the composition the other way for G. So for, for G, uh, you have an inclusion, P sigma, uh, an isomorphism and uh, Q rho for the f for the fixed point. I mean, in uh, sometime in uh, abstract Galois theory, such a thing could be called a Galois connection. And if you have a Galois connection, it uh, you get a bijection between the closed things on the two sides, and that's really uh, no more than that. Uh, now, that's, ex that's why I call that monadic and co-monadic, except that uh, in the uh, situations of having two categories and two functors like this, you have a monad and a co-monad, and uh, this decomposition, there is a decomposition, but the middle terms is not an isomorphism in general. So that makes things more complicated. It happens that uh, 
Um, uh, if, uh, to make it short, in the case of uh, f morphism of uh, phi between uh, two locales, so I will write phi like, like this, and you have the right hand one phi over star, uh, then if you compose uh, phi over star in phi this way, you call it sigma, it's, uh, it's an operator from A to A. But in addition to the uh, uh, conditions that I wrote for the closer operator, uh, preserve, it preserves meets. Uh, simply because uh, phi preserve is an homomorphism of French, so it preserves meets by definition an homomorphism. And phi over star being a right adjoint always preserve intersections, so the cut closer in meet. So uh, an operator, uh, a monadic operator. Uh, uh, which preserve meets uh, <clears throat> is called a nucleus in the theory of frames. In the theory of frame. And there is also a commonadic operator. which preserve meets for the same reason. Uh, I'm going to call it a co-nucleus, uh, but I have not been able to check in, uh, with people developing the tier of frames if this is the standard name for, uh, <coughs> for, this, for this notion. But I, I wasn't going to call it a co-nucleus. It seems to be a reasonable name. Um, and then, if you have a nucleus, um, you could look at the fixed points, and <clears throat> I'm going to call it A sigma, and the fixed point of a nucleus form a locale. It's, again, it's a poset, it's a locale again. And there is a, a quotient map that send x into sigma x, the closure. You see, so A sigma, the fixed point, is a locale, and this uh, quotient map Q uh, is a morphism of locale. Is it a frame? Thank you for. Uh, yes, thank you. From the beginning. Uh, so it's a quotient frame. Thank you. Uh, Okay, uh, maybe I should uh, just uh, stress the fact that uh, this is not a sublocale of A, this is a quotient locale. I mean, in the sense that the union here is not the usual union, because the union of those things is not closed. So uh, in the union here, the union of a family of closed elements, union with respect to sigma, okay, that's the closure of the. So, this is not a sublocal, but this this a sigma is of course included in a because by definition it's the set of fixed points. So, uh, the, but the inclusion is the right edge one to Q. Okay, but the inclusion does not preserve union. So, uh, however, the quotient map. I'm sorry, the quotient map is a morphism of the frame. Uh, a sigma is a subframe of A. So in the context of topological spaces, is it, so when you have a subspace of a topological space, is it a situation what you consider that is, that the frame of opens in Y is obtained like this from the frame of opens in X? No, we should not, uh, I don't know if I understand your uh, comment no, no, so uh, correctly, but we should not think of uh, sigma as like a closure uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the usual closure on the uh, subset of the topological space. Because the usual closure operator 
does not preserve intersection. The anterior preserve intersection, but not the closure. Okay. So okay. So that's this is really what people now call a group in the topology. This is what a group the topology is. A group the topology is exactly exhibiting an operator like that on on a frame with which preserve meets and. This is like the sheaves with respect to the growth of the topology. Okay, so uh, and on the, other, on the other side, you have B rho, the fixed point of the uh, other uh, of the co-nucleus, and now the inclusion is this is a frame, and the inclusion is a is a map of frame. This is a subframe. The inclusion preserves the union, and. Uh, and there is an isomorphism between the two, just induced by the map five. Okay. So uh, there is a theorem here, which is that there is a bijection between the um, quotient frame of a frame A. There is a bijection between the quotient frame and the nucleus, and there is a dual. Uh, theorem saying that there's a bijection between the subframe and the core nucleus. Okay, just completely dual. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> now I want to uh, talk about the free uh, frame. Uh, if if frames are really rings, I mean there should be free ones. So what are what are they? Because it, in, in commutative algebra, the polynomial ring is playing an important role. So you would like to know what are the three frames. Now, uh, I should say that uh, in uh, commutative algebra, the free algebra, the free commutative algebra on a set of generator is constructed actually in two steps. So you have the category of commutative rings, and you can forget that the ring has an addition, and you get into the category of commutative monoid. So there is a forgetful functor from commutative ring to commutative monoid, where you forget, and you can forget again if you like, and you get into the category of set, so forget. Uh, now, each of these two functor has a left adjoint. Uh, first, you can uh, generate a free commutative monoid from a set, and, uh, and second, you can generate uh, a free commutative ring from a commutative monoid. Uh, this one, uh, take a set X, and uh, it could be defined like, uh, I think it's sometimes denoted xn. Okay, that's a notation, Bourbaki notation, I guess, for the free commutative monoid on a set n. So that's, these are commutative monomials in x. Uh, and, and, and the second one, uh, you take uh, uh, n something here, okay, and you take the uh, a group, actually the monoid ring of it, Zn. So maybe I should write it like this. So uh, the free uh, commutative ring on a set uh, can be obtained by combining these two steps. Now I want to stress the fact, I mean the first step is just normal, but the second step has something peculiar about it, because Zn is Z tensor n. Actually, it's the free abelian group generated by the set n. You forget that n has a monoid structure. You take you uh, you linearize n, and that's it. This object is an abelian group by construction. Let's say uh, you could denote it uh, Z 
to the n, if you like. Uh, uh, you, so you, you take the free abelian group, and then it happens that this uh, free abelian group has a, uh, has a product. We all know that. And uh, this product gives uh, the free abelian group a ring structure, and that's the adjoint uh, of the forgetful functor. Now, this is a situation which happens uh, pretty often in mathematics. It is when there is a distributivity law, you see. Uh, there is a distributivity law between the free abelian group functor and the free monoid functor. And if you combine them, um, you get uh, a distributivity law, or maybe a distributive law. Distributive law. <coughs> or a commutation law. Uh, I, if I had time, I could uh, make it more precise. Uh, let's say, uh, think of the free abelian group functor as a functor from set to set, just because I want to see it as an endo functor. So you take the free abelian group functor, and you forget it's an abelian group, you get a set, okay? And this is an example of a monad. So there's, it has a multiplication. It's called a monad. And there's a unit. And <coughs> there is also the free commutative monoid functor, uh, let's say CM. Uh, again, I forget it's a monoid. I see it as an endo functor of set to set, and you have a monad structure on, on it. That comes simply because CM is the composite of a left adjoint with a right adjoint, and you get this monad structure. It's like the monadic and the comonadic operator before. Now, it happens that the composite of CM, if you compose CM with ab, that's a monad. Okay? Uh, because this is the free commutative ring functor. And so it must be a, it must must have a monad structure. So how is it that a composite of two monads is a monad? Um, this was uh, observed by uh, John Beck. When is it true that a composite of two monads is a monad? Um, years ago. Uh, <coughs> so you have a category C, and you have let's say uh, uh, two monads. And uh, you want to know uh, if, uh, uh, let's say, A composed compose with B is a monad. So what do you need to get a product on A composed with B? You would need to say, well, I'm going to do that. I, I want to exhibit a map like this, from the multiplications of A and the multiplications of B. But uh, uh, compositions of Hondo functor is not commutative. So you cannot switch A and B. You would like to switch A and B and replace that by, by uh, And then you will be in business because you will be able to use the multiplications on A and the multiplications on B to get back to A and B. But you need a, a switching operator, and the switching operator will go from BA to AB. Oh. And this switching operator, it's a little bit uh, like a young Baxter operator, if you like, but it, it doesn't need to be full. Oh, it doesn't need to be fully a Young-Baxter operator. 
but it's a, it's a commutation operator which is saying that uh, uh, if you were to do this construction the other way around, in other words, suppose that you're uh, by accident, by distraction, you want to construct this thing, and you first take the free abelian group followed by the free monoid. You won't get what you want, right? But you will be able to rearrange everything by, there will be a commutation operator, and this is called a distributivity or distributive law. This is so-called distributive law by John Beck. And <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry? A distributive law is a precise notion. It's not only an operator like this, but it must satisfy some compatibility relation with the multiplications of A and B, okay? So I don't have the time to write it down, okay? Now, uh, in the case of commutative rings, see, there is a distributivity law. And uh, in the case of, uh, of um, frames also, there is a distributive law. So in other words, uh, you can construct the free uh, uh, frame in two steps on, uh, on a post set. So I'm going to consider the category of frames. And I forget that there is an addition. I got, forget Suprema. So we get into lower semi-lattice. A lower semi-lattice has just uh, 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 an infimum operations, finite infimum. You don't have a uh, suprema or inf general infima, and you have a unit one. So this is what defines a lower semi-lattice. So you can forget that the frame has an addition and then keep forgetting and goes into the category of posets. Now, this functor has a left adjoint, which consists into adding uh, finite meets to a poset. The construction is very explicit. And this other functor also has a left adjoint. And this left adjoint is very simple because it coincides with the left adjoint from soup lattices. All right, soup lattices for the category of complete lattices and soup preserving maps. And then there is a forgetful functor here. And the left adjoint is, uh, I call it D, um, D of a poset, P is the set of lower sections of P. S is uh, a downward, it's called also a downward, downward section. Or a cribble of P. So it means that uh, if X is in S and uh, y is smaller than x, then y is an s. Okay? Now, this poset is, is, has suprema. I mean, it has suprema, and it's, uh, it's the left adjoint to the forgetful functor from the category of coup, complete lattices and su with suprema to poset. There is a left adjoint. And here, here it is. See, this is the same d. So there is, a, I should finish with that. Uh, with the analogy. So we have sets, abelian groups. And commutative rings. Okay, so that's a, a sequence. And we know that uh, if you want to study uh, commutative rings, you need to study ABN groups first, or modules or something like that. 
But now we are going to extend that. We take post sets. And instead of a billion group, I take soup lattices. And here I put frames. Um, and the category of soup lattices is really like the category of Fabian groups. We know that the category of Fabian group has tensor product, hum, you know, and it's additive. The additivity of the category of Fabian groups means that the coproduct, finite coproduct, and the product coincide. It's called a direct sum. The soup lattices is the same thing. That's additive. Except that here it's even stronger. Any coproduct of soup lattices is also the product. It's very strongly additive. It's the presence of infinitary operations that makes this uh, strongly additive. And it's close, it's, it is symmetric monoidal close. Uh, <clears throat> and a frame is a commutative ring, is some special kind, actually, of commutative ring in the category of soup lattices. So there is a general uh, scheme here that uh, I think uh, Deligne has suggested in a paper uh, that maybe uh, algebraic uh, geometry could be generalized to any uh, situation where you start with uh, a symmetric monoidal category, which is additive in some sense, and you consider a commutative monoid object in there, and they form your ring, and you take the opposite and they form your scheme. And these uh, things just follow this pattern completely. In some sense, we could say that, theory, that the theory of locale is really like the theory of schemes. Mm -hmm. But it is... Just, it's not really actually because if you take two lattices and if you, if you take this as a monoidal category, you won't get frames. Frames are particular objects. Right? Yes, of course. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Frames are particular objects. So in fact, you are, you are focusing on particular... That's objects, tr true. That's true. The general uh, rings here uh, with soup lattices are called quantal. That's, uh, they, are, they don't need to be commutative. And the commutative ones are called commutative quantal. And commutative quantals are not the same extent. Not That's same exactly extent. true. But there is a nice connection between the two. Mm -hmm. The inclusions of frame into commutative quantal has both a left and a right adjoint. And it, it's, it makes uh, life uh, very nice. If you it's very easy to transport theorems about commutative quantiles to theorems about frame using this, this adjunction. Um, I guess I should stop here. Uh, thank you very much.